not to love about you. Heaven and earth adore you. The kings and kingdoms bow down. The Son of God, you are the one. You are the one. We're living for. Yes. You are the love that frees us. You are the light that leads us. Like a fire burning. A son of
that there's only one name that we can call upon. That's it. One That's name. It. Yes. Through which salvation comes. There is no other name. He's the only one. He's the one we've been waiting for. There's none that's coming after him. He's the only one. And he is the only one that's able to break the chain. The chains that bind us. Whatever your chain is, whatever's got you bound, that keeps you from moving forward in your life, you know what it is. It's in your heart. You know what it is. I ask that during this song, you let God work that thing out. Give it to him. Give it to him. Let him break it. Because he's the only one that's in you. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain. To break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain. Yes. In 
name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Wow. 
a 400-foot sinkhole that cleaned five sports cars, most of two businesses, a three-bedroom house, and the deep end of an Olympic-sized swimming pool. That's a big hole. I started looking at some of the pictures. It's one sinkhole. It looked like that scene in a Fantastic Four where there was this giant hole in the ground. It was just huge. It looked like it was man-made. It was so, so perfectly rounded and deep. What causes sinkholes? Some say it's lack of rainfall. Some say it's too much rainfall in too short a period of time. The ground becomes saturated. Others say this fracking thing where they're just blowing gas and blowing air underground. Some people believe because they're, they're actually digging below the water table that it's causing it to cave in. It really doesn't matter what causes a sinkhole. The bottom line is it's a horrible way to die. Can you imagine being in your bed sleeping and then the next moment you're in a bottomless pit somewhere with no way out? With that introduction, I want to preach today on the subject when the bottom drops out. Here in Numbers chapter 16 is the story of a sinkhole that wasn't caused by a lack of rain or too much rain or any changes in the climate. It was a sinkhole that was caused by God as a judgment against the rebellion of the people. This sinkhole was a one-time incident. It's the only mention of such a thing happening in the Bible. But I believe there's a spiritual application for us as believers. As we take a cl closer look at this incident, let me say that you may never come across a sinkhole, but you may find that the bottom of your life is about ready to drop out. And that's just as bad as coming up against any sinkhole when the bottom of your life just <laughs> falls out. By way of background, Moses had been called by God to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. God brought several plagues upon Egypt that literally destroyed the land of this might, once mighty nation. He then parted the Red Sea so that people could pass through on dry ground. When the Egyptian army pursued, God let them walls of water fall and the Egyptian army was destroyed in that water. Now, it was God's intention that they enter the promised land of Canaan. That was God's intention. They were so close to the promised land of Canaan that they could look across the way, look across that Jordan River and see the promised land. That's how close they were. It was God's intention that they just pass through that wilderness on their way to the promised land. But it didn't work out that way because of the unbelief of the people. Because there was giants in the land, they were afraid to go when God told them to go. And they ended up spending the next 40 years wandering around out there in that wilderness. Half a million Jews. Now, Numbers chapter 16 mentions a fellow named Korah. Let's take a look at it. Verses 1 and 2. Now, Korah, the son of Ishar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Nathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. Korah was a cousin of Moses and Aaron. Korah was a Levite that had the great responsibility of transporting the various elements of the tabernacle. We are also told of Dathan, Abiram, and On, who were Reubenites. Now notice verse 3. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron, and said unto them, You take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. And when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. Lastly, we are told of 250 princes among the Jews, men of renown, famous among the people. They were kind of like the rock stars of their day and age. Three different groups of people 
that had one thing in common. They were all dissatisfied. They were all tired of Moses running the show. And they wanted to be in charge. Which brings us to the first thing that will cause the bottom of your life to drop out. This is the first sinkhole you may face. Number one, the sinkhole of being dissatisfied. As stated earlier, they were being used by God. They held positions of importance among the people. But it wasn't enough. They wanted more. <coughs> In Sunday school, we've been looking at the fall of Lucifer. He was an archangel with one-third of the angels under his command. He was in charge of the worship music in heaven. He had the honor and privilege of guarding the throne of God. Lucifer should have been satisfied with the position he was given. But it wasn't enough. He wanted to be worshipped as God. Isaiah chapter 14 uh, tells us about the fall of Lucifer. Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast sinned in thine heart. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. That's what he was. He wanted. Note, Isaiah chapter 14 compares hell to a deep pit. No matter what you have, no matter how good your life seems to be, the devil will try to make you restless. He will hit you with a spirit of discontent that will cause you to become dissatisfied with everything. How else to explain the fact that there's so many unhappy people to look at their lives outwardly? They've got the two-car garage. They've got a white picket fence, 2.3 kids, whatever that may be. They've got everything. The in-ground swimming pool. They've got their time share. And on and on I could list things that you would think would make them happy. But you get to talk to them, and they're miserable. Their lives are empty. The devil will try to cause you to have a spirit of discontent. And once that settles in, you're in trouble. You will find yourself getting bored with a Christian life and becoming restless with each passing day. Chomping at the bit to go back out into the world to see what the world has to offer. You'll become restless with, with a desire for a better church. If it exists, Something that has more to offer. Surely the grass must be greener on the other side of the fence. Many have left good solid churches where they're being used by God in some way, where their children were comfortable, where God's hand of blessing was upon them, looking for something else that they never did find. You'll find yourself hating your job, looking for a reason to quit or to get yourself fired. You'll become tired of your marriage, frustrated with your kids. <coughs> Wanting to go back to your old sinful ways. Christians are trying like flies because they allow this spirit of discontent to pull them away from God. And if you listen to the devil's lies long enough, you're going to find your life heading for a sinkhole. How do you overcome dissatisfaction? Only by walking in the spirit. Because only then do we have a heartfelt desire for the things of God. Amen. You know what I'm talking about. When you're walking in the Spirit, you can't wait to get in church. You have a hunger to read your Bible. Yeah. You have a desire to pray. Amen. You have a burden to tell others how they might be saved. You have an interest in the things of God. Can't say that when you're in the flesh. Every day there's a struggle going on, a tug of war between our flesh and the Spirit. The days we start our, our day with God, we're in the Spirit. But the days we don't, our flesh is just beating us up left and right. Mm -hmm. You put too many days in the flesh together, and you're going to have a spirit of discontent upon you. That's right. In Philippians 2, 2, Paul said, have no confidence in the flesh. Have no confidence. Why? Because your flesh will let you down. 
Because your flesh has no interest in the things of God. Our flesh is like a cage lion. That was another article. This volunteer at this, at this animal place got mauled by a lion. Evidently, this lion took his paw and somehow lifted up the cage. And this girl was in one cage cleaning it out. And this lion came up behind her and mauled her to death. Wow. Got me to think that's exactly what our flesh is like. Our flesh is like a cage lion. Like a wild animal just pacing back and forth, pacing back and forth, hoping and waiting for an opportunity to get loose. It might not happen today. It might not happen tomorrow. But you let your guard down just a little bit and leave that cage open. Our flesh, like a ravening lion, is going to do as much damage as it possibly can. If you put together too many lost weekends, you'll find yourself in a sinkhole trying to figure out how do I get in this predicament. Because of our flesh. There is a second thing you can do to overcome dissatisfaction, and that's be content with what God has given you. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. That's a children's song, but you know what? There's a powerful truth right there. Count your blessings. Why? Because we're so quick to forget what God has done for us. I think of those children of Israel that I just mentioned. I mean, they should have gotten it. God destroyed the most powerful nations through the plagues. They didn't have to raise not one weapon up against in Egypt. That's right. God parted the Red Sea. He did. God provided for their needs. He, did. he had everything under control. But they no sooner got out of Egypt than they started complaining. Oh, well, we were better off in Egypt with the leeks and the garlic and the onions. Oh, we should have stayed where we were. Oh, you brought us out here to die. Some of you have said, wait a second, fellas, wait a second. Let's stop here a minute and regroup. Has God been with us? You see that Shekinah glory that's over the tabernacle? You know what that means? God is in our midst. We ain't got nothing to worry about. But I can't get on them Jews too bad because we do the same thing. One week we testify, bless God, he's good, fellas. Let me tell you, God is good. He just got me through another scrape. He just delivered me from a serious problem. Oh, God is good. A week later, two weeks later. Nobody knows the troubles I've seen. <laughs> Nobody knows my Jesus. I heard that story about a fellow who's getting ready to jump out of a building. This Christian went up there to try to talk him out of it, and they both ended up jumping out of the building. Why? He was so negative, he convinced that Christian there was no hope. Stay away from that crowd. Proverbs 27, 20 says, Hell and destruction are never full. So the eyes of man are never satisfied. You notice lately, we're getting bombarded with commercials. You might be watching a program and then get like two or three minutes of commercials and half the time you don't know what they're selling, but they're just blasting you out of your socks, turning up the volume, salting your eyes with things they convince you you've got to have. Yeah. I know friends that can't sleep at night, so they'll stay up late at night watching that home shopping network, and they'll wake up the next day saying, what the heck did I just buy? They'll buy all this junk that they feel like they just got to have, and then when it arrives, they're trying to figure out how to pay for it. I like what the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, if you want to turn there. 1 Timothy chapter 6 gives real good advice about contentment. Probably the greatest passage that speaks about being content in what God gives you. Truth be known, we don't need as much as we think we do. There's a difference between your needs and your wants. Your needs are the things you need to get through each and every day. And God will provide for our needs. He has promised to do that. Our wants is just the icing on the cake. And if you're walking with God in your ways, please God, He may even give you that too. The Bible says to... Desire, he'll give you the desires of your heart if you set your affection on the things of God. So he'll even do that. Notice what it says here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning with verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. That's something we should be striving for. It's not enough to be godly and worldly. It's not enough to be godly and be discontented. 
Godliness with contentment is great gain in the Christian life. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. There's a truth. You watch these programs and these hoarders that hoard everything, that scuttle this junk, and then when they die, they can't take it with them. First thing the family does is have a yard sale and say, here, take it, please. Can't take nothing with you out of this world except other souls. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. You can put parentheses right there, sinkhole. Drown men in perdition and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O oh man of God, flee these things. Apostle Paul put it like this in Philippians 4.11. For I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I can do all things through Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 413. Even though Korah and his buddies held important positions and responsibilities, they wanted more. They wanted the authority that Moses was given. Which brings us to the second sinkhole mentioned here, and it's the sinkhole of rebellion. <clears throat> Back to Numbers, chapter 16, beginning with verse 3. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron, and said unto them, You take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, and every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord? And when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. And he spake unto Korah and unto all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show you who are his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him. Even him whom he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. The sinkhole of rebellion. Mark it down. The dissatisfaction always leads to rebellion. 1 Samuel 15, 23 puts it like this. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Witchcraft is pretty bad. God sees rebellion the same way. Earlier I mentioned how Lucifer had become dissatisfied with his position in heaven. And it was only a matter of time before he raised up a rebellion against God and convinced one third of the angels to join him in this rebellion. And then they all ended up getting kicked out of heaven. Where do you read that, Brother Bill? Revelation chapter 12 talks about the rebellion of Satan. Revelation chapter 12, just in case you were curious. Revelation 12, 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. That's talking about angels and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Talking about Israel, talking about Mary. Uh, verses 7 and 8. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. Do you like how the Bible just fits all together like that? Earlier I mentioned how Moses, through God, delivered the children of Israel from the bondage of Egypt. God destroyed Egypt through the plagues. Egypt's army was destroyed in the Red Sea. All they had to do was make it through a short journey in the wilderness. That's it. The problem was they no sooner left Egypt and they started murmuring and complaining. Not just a one-time thing. I mean, we've all had those kind of moments. Things don't work out. You kind of get mad at God. Start complaining to God. It wasn't a one-time thing. It happened each step of the way. It finally got to Moses. He was supposed to speak to that rock to bring forth water. He said, you rascals. And he struck that thing twice. Wasn't supposed to do that. Ended up keeping him out of, out of the promised land. 
finally got to him. The Bible says Moses was the meekest man that ever lived. But even he had a breaking point. But let me just show you. Turn over to your left to Exodus chapter 15. This is what was going on here. Exodus 15, 24. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? The waters were bitter. They were ready to kill Moses and Aaron and head back to Egypt. God made the waters sweet. Problem was taken care of. Something should have registered in your mind. You know what? Bless God, if he can make these bitter waters sweet, we ain't got nothing to worry about. Bless God. Amen. But that's not what happened. <laughs> Exodus chapter 16, verses 2 and 3. And the whole congregation, talking about half a million Jews, of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat, eat bread to the full. For you have brought us forth into this wilderness, to kill this whole assembly with hunger. They were riled up. They said we were better off where we were. No, you weren't. You gotta be careful what you say to God that way. Yeah. So there's a second incident. Let me give you another one. Chapter 17, Exodus 17, verses 2 and 3. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? Real interesting. Notice what Moses says to the people. <coughs> Getting back to this Exodus 16. You need to see this. Exodus 16, 7. In the morning, then ye shall see the glory of the Lord, for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we that you murmur against us? When we murmur, we may think we're talking into the air, we're talking to ourselves, but the Bible says that God hears our murmurs. Wow. Think about that. Mm -hmm. Verse 8, the Lord heareth your murmurings, which you murmur against, against Him. Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. That's an important passage right there. We really don't think about how <coughs> complaining we do and murmuring we do, but God takes it as a serious thing. We complain to our co-workers, we complain to our wife about this and that, to our husband about this and that. And God hears every complaint and every bit of murmuring. And He don't appreciate it. Basically, when we start murmuring, we're saying we're not trusting God, that God's not doing enough, that God ain't taking care of business. Spiritually, we're murmuring against God. When we murmur and complain, it means we're not trusting Him to work everything out. And it means we've allowed that spirit of discontent and that attitude of being dissatisfied to poison our souls. <clears throat> Just as if someone gave you some poison. That's what it's like. Just as if someone gave you some poison. There are folks that are so miserable and so negative, it's actually poisoned their personalities. Listen, we got to get our joy back. Amen? Man. we got to get our joy back. Joy is a sweetness in your soul that will wash away whatever bitterness yeah. you may be harboring. Get your joy back. Get your joy button fixed. Whatever you got to do, God is good. He delivered us from the fires of hell. We've been set free from the bondage of sin. We no longer have to fear the devil. No matter what this world throws at us, we got heaven waiting for us. Praise the Lord. That's joyous to me. We've got to stop complaining about our life before God decides to give us something to really complain about. That's right. And He's done that to me. I'd be complaining about this and that, and then God just laid something on me, and I was like, oh Lord, stay in your hand. I get it, Lord. Pick your battles. The bottom line is the fact that all the negativity leads to an attitude of rebellion. Korah thought he was a big shot. Same with those 250 princes and their rock star attitude. Nobody was going to tell them what to do. Notice what they say to Moses in verse Exodus 16.3. Put another way, 
They told Moses who died and left you boys. I used to hear that a lot growing up. My parents used to say, who died and left you boys? Well, nobody that I know of. But that's what they're saying there. Who, who put you in charge, Moses? Are you the only one that can hear from God? Listen, pride is a dangerous thing. Proverbs 16, 18 declares, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Before that sinkhole. Proverbs 13, 10 puts it like this. Only by pride cometh contentions. That means at the root of every fight, every argument or disagreement, at the root of it is pride. Pride was the devil's downfall. And if we're not careful, pride will drop us right into that sinkhole. Judas Iscariot was called by the Lord Jesus personally to be one of his followers, to be one of the twelve apostles. No greater privilege existed at that time than to be chosen by God to follow him. For three and a half years, he was given the honor and privilege of hearing the Son of God preach. I would have given anything just for even a minute of hearing the Lord preach that Sermon on the Mount. Can you imagine that? They were right there, right in the front row, just like this, listening as Jesus was breaking down Bible truths, the Word of God, just preaching like a storm. Not only did they hear His words, they beheld His mighty miracles. What miracle would you like to have seen? Raising Lazarus from the dead, maybe? Feeding the 5,000 with a loaf of bread and a few fishes? Walking on water? I would have love to have a front seat for any one of those things. For anything. Turning the water into wine. They saw it all. They beheld it all. And on top of all that, Judas was so highly regarded by the other disciples that they made him the treasure. How do we know that? He held the bag. Which means he was responsible for whatever money came in and how it was distributed to buy groceries. Whatever they had to do. He held the bag. <coughs> You would have thought that Matthew, being a tax collector, would have been given that position. I got a feeling that when God turned his life around for his glory, he didn't want to want no part of handling yes. that money. That's Give it to true. somebody else. I'm going another way. Yeah. At the Last Supper, Judas was sitting right next to Jesus. John the Beloved was on one side, so close to Jesus, he could lay his head upon Jesus' bosom. And on the other side was Judas. Because when Jesus said, what thou doest, do quickly, he didn't have to yell it halfway across the table. He turned and looked right at him as Judas was getting ready to dip that bread and that into that sauce, whatever he was eating. No one else even heard what Jesus said because when Judas went out, they thought Jesus had to send him out to get some more groceries. That's how close he was to Jesus. Judas had it all. He could have been used by God in a great and mighty way. But he allowed the devil to poison his soul. He rebelled against God and ended up betraying the Son of God for 30 pieces of silver. Judas is now burning in the hottest depths of hell. And Jesus declared in Matthew 26, 24, Woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. What about that? The question before us is, how do you avoid that sinkhole of rebellion? Number one, you must humble yourself before God. Yes. Before God has to humble you. I guarantee you, you get on a high horse about yourself, your head swells up when you think you can't get through the doors of the church, when you think that you're a gift to the church, when you think that the church can't go on without you, God's going to take the wind right out of your sails. That's right. That's right. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 declares, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he stand, take heed, lest he fall. You allow pride to fill yourself up. Watch where you step. You may be falling into a sinkhole. Uh, Galatians 6, 3. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Watch out for that sinkhole. Never lose sight of the fact that we're nothing but a lump of clay 
that God has saw fit to breathe life into. That's it. Pick up some dirt sometime. Rub it in your hands. I like to do, I used to like to buy some modeling clay, and I'd just start making that modeling clay, make a little figure out of it, and say, man, but for the grace of God, that's me right there. God took that lump of clay and went, breathe life into it. Glory. Here's what we're up against. This struggle between humility and pride. Uh, 1 Peter 5.5 5 declares this. Be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him. For he cares for you. If you allow pride to get the best of you, he's going to bring you down. You're going to fall into a sinkhole. If you humble yourself before God has to humble you, he's going to lift you up. So you can't go wrong with that. Just be humble. The disciples were fighting among themselves as to which one was the greatest. Jesus demonstrated true greatness is having a servant's attitude. Jesus humbled himself and started washing their feet. And it blew their minds. There's greatness right there. Strive for that. Here's what so often happens. God loves you. And God begins pouring out blessings upon you. He may give you a raise. A promotion. Some ministry within the church. Number 16 mentions that those princes were famous men of renown. Whatever success we achieve. Whatever recognition we are given, it's all because of the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Never lose sight of that. James 1.17 states that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father yes. of light. Amen. In fact, the only thing we can take credit for is our mistakes. That will keep you humble. Amen. If there's anything good in my life, it's because of Him. Yes. The second thing we must do to overcome the sinkhole of rebellion is pray. Pray and ask God to keep us humble. Yes. Someone gives you a compliment, they mean well when they say it, but in your heart you should pray, Oh, glory to you, God. Yes. All preeminence to you, God. Yes. Thank you, God. Yes. I just do that now reflexively. I like compliments just like everybody else, but I know who's, I know who's the source of whatever they're talking about is God. Yes. Give God all the glory, honor, and praise, for He alone is worthy. Yes. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Prince of peace is worthy of our praise. When Korah challenged Moses, Moses didn't puff up his chest and say, I'm in charge here. Notice what he did. Verse 4, and when Moses heard it, he fell down upon his face, just like somebody shot him, just dropped right there. Why did he do that? Number one, because he knew that God had called him to lead the people and that Korah was about to make the biggest mistake of his life. The Bible tells us to pray for our enemies. And that's what Moses did. Korah was heading for a major sinkhole. Moses fell right to his knees. Oh God, open his eyes. Open his eyes, God. Let him see the mistake he's about to make. Oh Father, he's not rising up against me. He's rising up against you. Korah was heading for a sinkhole that led straight to hell. Number two, Moses wasn't about to get in a fight with this guy, so he humbled himself before the Lord. That's good counsel right there. Philippians 2.3 declares, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. That's the best way to avoid an argument or a fight. Esteem others better than yourselves. Walk away from it. You're, I'm not going to fight with you. When someone wants to get into an argument or confrontation with you, don't bring yourself down to their level. You don't have to say a word. You don't have to do a thing. Just give it to God. Yes. He will take care of it. Can you prove that? I'll let you leave I can. Romans chapter 12. I'm just about done here. Romans chapter 12. I don't know if you've noticed it. But as the time of the Lord's return draws near, it seems like the devil's turning up the heat. Everywhere you go, you're running into confrontations. 
supermarket checkout lines, motor vehicles, at your job. Someone takes your pencil sharpener or your pencils and people are ready to go to battle. Someone takes your parking spot or parks somewhere without a handicap sticker, whatever it may be. People are ready to go to war. We had this little bit of snow and neighbors are putting out chairs and tables and everything else. Don't take my parking spot. Good night. Romans 12, 18. If it's possible, it's not always possible, but if it's possible, as much as life in you, as much as you can, live peaceably with all men. Yes. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself. Don't try to get revenge, but rather give place under your wrath. For it's written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. God saying, you don't have to get mad. You don't even have to get even. Just give it to me and I'll take care of it. That's right. Amen. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Good words. Now, as I close, some of you are probably wondering, okay, you've been talking about sinkholes all this time. Where's the sinkhole in the Bible? I'm getting to it. <laughs> This morning I mentioned two things that will cause the bottom of your life to drop out. Two things that will cause you to fall into a sinkhole. A dissatisfied spirit and an attitude of rebellion. There are several other things we'll look at tonight. Well, here's what happened. Here's the rest of the story. Korah challenged Moses to determine who God wanted in charge. Number 16.5. Drop down to verse 29. Verse 29. Here's what Moses said as far as this child. He's saying, look, whatever happens, I'm telling you, you'll know who God has chosen. But if the Lord, uh, verse 29, if these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me, Moses. But if the Lord makes a new thing, and the earth opens her mouth and swallows them up with all that appertains unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. Moses declares that if Korah died a normal death, lived a long life and died of old age, then he, Moses, had not been called by God to lead them. So if nothing happens tomorrow, I'm wrong. I'm not the one. On the other hand, if Korah and his followers are swallowed up by a giant sinkhole, then you'll know that God has called me to lead the people and that they were nothing but troublemakers. That's right. Notice what happens next. Verse 31. And it came to pass, as he made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened up her mouth and swallowed them up in their houses, and all the men that appertained, appertained unto Korah, and all their goods, they and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregations. And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them, for they said, Let's the earth swallow us up also. And there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. Wow. Moses no sooner got these words out of his mouth. He said, This is what will happen. He no sooner finished his last sentence than that earth just swallowed them up. <coughs> Opened up and swallowed them up. Their houses, their possessions, everything that they had, gone. They didn't have cable back then, so there was no cable wire leading to that sinkhole. Now, unlike the sinkholes in Florida, which remain open till someone fills them up with gravel and cement, God's sinkhole closed up immediately leaving no trace of Korah as if he never existed. What? It made such a powerful impact upon the rest of the crowd that they took off a run unless they got s swallowed up also. Now some folks might say, well, at least Korah and his followers didn't suffer. It was a quick end. 